Welcome to another edition of the Aces Loaded Podcast. It's great to have you with us as always. My name is Zach Bayrudi. My co-host this week is Vince Rafino, who's, uh, what is this, like your, your fifth co-hosting of the pod? I haven't been keeping tally, but uh, it's an, uh, always an honor to be here, Zach. You know, I feel like I feel like you have a good feel for the number of times you've co-hosted. I, I feel like we're at about five. So it's, it's believe it or not, my ego has not swelled to that level. <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head how many podcasts or interviews I've I've done. Uh, may, maybe maybe in a few years we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. For sure, for sure. Well, it's it's great to have you along, man. Uh, and uh, hope you're doing well. You doing okay up there in Reno? Just wanted to do the quick check in as always. Yeah, man, it's it's great to be here. Uh, everyone is, uh, you know, just kind of trying to abide by the rules, but uh, trying to get as much exercise in the mountains as I can, going hiking, running, um, and, and trying to stay active, but uh, also trying to stay safe. But fortunate enough, friends and family are well. Uh, how about you back back in Cali? We're good, man. There's uh, there's no complaints. It's it's a it's uh, tough with COVID in our county right now in San Joaquin County where we are. Uh, but other, I mean, it's you know, other than that. As far as my family and my friends, like we're all being very cautious. So that's, that's really all you can do. Um, we're going we're gonna to keep this really succinct today because we have a great guest on tap. It's Tyler Heineman, who was the opening day starter behind the plate for the San Francisco Giants this year. Um, he was kind enough to join us, former Reno Ace from a year ago, played in 25 games. And, uh, and he, he did what he usually does while with Reno. He raked. He hit 325 with a homer and 13 ribbies. I mean, he's... He, he has been well on his way for a while, but he has some great perspective to offer as far as what's been going on in baseball and also he can get into the nitty gritty of his journey, which has been so interesting. I mean, he's a, a guy that hit, and I'm going to tell him this too, 285 career hitter in the minors. Like there are guys that have hit way less than that and have, and have been behind the plate, you know, as catchers that have gotten opportunities. So I think for Tyler, and you could speak to this too, having seen him last year in Reno, I think this opportunity he's getting is long overdue. For sure. I think watching him last year, you could tell uh, day in and day out watching him as a player, he's just a solid catcher. Um, and one that would translate well to the major leagues, just one that honestly needed the opportunity. Um, you know, his numbers don't necessarily jump off the page, uh, you know, a 285 hitter. Um, and, uh, but he consistently does that. He doesn't have a high, he doesn't have a low. Um, you know, he's not going to put up 30 home runs, but he's going to hit you 10 to 15 every single year. And at every step of the way, when you look at his numbers, that's really what kind of his career looks like is just a consistent hitter at every level, putting up the same kind of numbers. So no surprise to me that he goes up to the major leagues and puts up a 280 and, and hits a couple of home runs, drives in and, and catches a really good game. He was a very athletic catcher. Um, from his time here, he could get up out of his crouch and throw the ball to second base and, and help control the running game, um, which in, a, in the shortened season this year, you're seeing is even more important now. So um, I think he's really cut out for it. And I'm so, so excited to see that he has this opportunity now uh, with the Giants in San Francisco. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk to him about his opportunity, obviously, his path. We're going to talk to him about John Savage, who's his college coach at UCLA, who is a Reno guy. So we'll localize it there for you. Um, and also, we're going to talk to him about his card tricks. Now, you you got to see it firsthand last year. My my buddy Jason Schwartz, who is the, the broadcaster for the Jethawks in, in Lancaster, Tyler played there in, in 2013, spent the whole year there. I told Jason I was going to talk to Tyler, and he was like, dude, you have to ask him about the card tricks. <laughs> and then you said the same thing. So mm -hmm. you've seen him in person? Uh, I have seen him a little bit. Uh, he he uh, interacted with, uh, he held a like small little show. Uh, the Illusionists were in town, which is a, a really great traveling performing group um, that does, you know, card tricks. And they also do illusions and magic and all kinds of stuff within their show. Um, so they came into the clubhouse and worked with Tyler and they each did kind of competing card tricks and stuff like that for some of the guys uh, just to kind of loosen up the dog days of summer. Um, and it's, it's hilarious, man. And in, in, to see people's reactions, um, I'm sure that's what he feeds off of too. But when you see just how all the different guys react and to see the personalities of the players, it's a real treat to see what he brings out of um, uh, some people and, and players that don't normally show, emote or show a lot of emotion where, you know, obviously and having a good time. It was, it's a lot of fun. Tyler's a great guy to have in any organization. Um, he was a pleasure to have here in Reno. It was great working with him from a social media front. Um, just the guy that wanted to help push baseball to, to anyone or anyone that would, would be interested so he was he's he's great and uh like i said i'm so excited uh that he has this opportunity with the giants and hope and i'm sure he's going to capitalize on it 
I'm, I'm excited for him to tell the story. You won't believe how it started with him. Usually card tricks, like you start doing them as a kid, but it was later in life when he started doing it and, and the venue where he, where he started doing it was pretty interesting. We're excited to get into that. Again, we're going to keep this short so we can get into Tyler, but first, uh, before we get to the break and then get to Tyler, uh, how nice is it to have baseball back? And I know there have been challenges the last couple of weeks, with, with, especially in Miami. We're going to get Tyler's thoughts on that too, but how nice is it to put the TV on and just have baseball going or put the radio on as I've been doing out in the backyard, have baseball going? Uh, it's, it's been incredible. Uh, it's so therapeutic for me. I mean, so much of, of my summer culture is – working in the afternoon, uh, you know, um, on a project, but, you know, there's a game on in the background, uh, whether it's an East Coast game, uh, I tune into it. I watch a couple of different teams, you know, Yankees, Mets are, are two teams that I keep tabs on and watch the D-backs, and then any interesting matchups or anything else, I have MLB, t MLB TV, so I can hop around and, and watch whatever, but it's been such a, such a blessing to have that back. Um, I think it's been uh, really great for all of us that work in sports, especially baseball, just to see it have it be a, a front of thought again and, and really help us, um, you know, fuel that passion that we have for, for the sport. And it, it makes, it makes it a little bit easier every day um, to deal with the minutia of working in sport yeah. when sport is actually taking place. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, I've just been basking in the globe baseball on the radio, literally in my backyard every day, just kind of getting some, some projects done. Uh, also not to be, uh, not to be outdone Reno 1868 uh, at the yeah. time we're recording this had a big win. Uh, in Portland on uh, Wednesday night, which would have been last night at the time we're recording this. So shout out to 1868 uh, and also great to have soccer back too, right? Yeah, they have to, everyone needs to make sure that they tune into the radio broadcast. Uh, yours truly is on the call. So uh, we have a match coming up uh, Saturday, which will be the day after that this is released. Um, there's matches, you know, one to two matches a week for the foreseeable future for the next few months here. So I would advise anyone looking for sports in the Reno area, there might be an opportunity in the very near future to attend a Reno 1868 match at Greater Nevada Field. We're very hopeful for that. So, um, you know, there's a great opportunity for people that, that want to get their sports fixed. There's a local team here playing and really good. Top of Group A right now in first place. Um, so making a push for the playoffs in this shortened season. Um. Yeah, the, the broadcast for 1868 on radio, ESPN 94.5 FM. Want to give them a shout out. I'm doing the broadcast from my house and I'm, I'm doing it off of a monitor. It's the most unique broadcast experience <laughs> I've ever had, but I'm having a lot of fun doing it and I'm just excited to be calling sports again. So uh, I've mm -hmm. enjoyed getting to know 1868. And shout out to Nevada Sports Network too, who has picked up all the games for local television as well. So you can listen to Zach on the radio. <clears throat> you can watch the games on television. Um, you can also watch them online through ESPN Plus. So the games are readily available for anyone that wants to catch up or, or get into it. You know, this is Reno's um, third season in the USL, and, and they break records in terms of winning. Um, so hopefully we can get to the championship and bring one home this year. Amen. All right, let's, let's get to Tyler. Uh, real quick, want to give a shout out to Brian Vanderbeek, who had the song that we opened the podcast with. The song's called He'll Put Us on the Map. If You might be familiar with Brian Vanderbeek, a longtime uh, sports writer for the Modesto B. If you're familiar with the Central Valley of California, he covered uh, the Modesto A's and then the Modesto Nuts for a number of years. He's retired now, and he's a, he's a great, uh, talented wordsmith and musician. It was a really sweet song. Uh, that he he wrote and recorded about uh, about a minor league player in a small town, and I I hope you enjoyed it. We figure we uh, would open the pod with it today, and and with that, uh, we're going to take a break. We'll come back and we'll chat with San Francisco Giants catcher Tyler Heineman, and that's coming up after this on the Aces Loaded podcast. Steer clear of speed bumps when you buy your next vehicle, and cruise into savings with Greater Nevada Credit Union. Our loan experts will give you a roadmap for a loan that fits your budget and your lifestyle. With quick approvals, low rates, and flexible terms, we'll put you in the driver's seat faster. It's our way of helping more people live greater. Apply online or call 855-LIVE-GREATER. Let's go. Right, good. Go! 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 
We are back. It's the Aces Loaded podcast, and we are pleased to be joined by a former Aces catcher, Tyler Heineman, now, of course, catching for the San Francisco Giants, the opening day starter behind the plate for, uh, for San Francisco. And, and what, a, what a story, what a ride it's been, and we're going to get into that. But first of all, Tyler, how are you doing, and, and how is your family? Is everybody healthy? I'm great. Yeah, thanks. Uh, luckily, yeah, everyone's healthy, and uh, you know, hopefully we're going to keep it that way. So it's a crazy time for sure. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, you had a crazy 2019, which also led into a crazy 2020. Uh, last year, when you were with Reno, 25 games, you hit 325, uh, 13 ribbies. You were then traded to the Marlins, where you made your big league debut on September 4th. Um, what was last year like for you with all the movement and then to, to have it punctuated by your big league debut? Uh, it was yeah, it was a lot for sure. You know, I've been drafted in 2012, so it was – I think that was nine years or eight years in the minors and um you know first year as a free agent chose the d-backs uh loved playing in reno got traded when um you know some movement happened in the big leagues and then uh went to miami or went to new orleans continued to try and just play as well as i can and you know finally got an opportunity to, to go to the big leagues and uh uh it was very special. You know, it's funny. You bring up the time that, that you spent in the minor leagues, which was, you know, eight years. Um, I saw you play in Lancaster in 2013. I spent 14 years in the Cal League, so I saw you all of 2013. You hit 286 that season. Your career 285 hitter in the minors, you've never really had a bad season, yet it took you a while to get your first big league opportunity. Was there a point you started asking yourself, like, why not me, especially being a catcher who can hit like you can? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I've had, I've had some times where where I think like that, but you know, um, I think it's just it's about the timing and an opportunity. Um, you know, the teams that I were on, uh, you know, when I was on the Astros, there weren't too many injuries. Uh, I didn't really play my way up to the big leagues, like you know, force somebody out of a job, and you know, I was just I was just there. I was good enough. I I hit well enough, um, but I didn't. I didn't force anyone's hand. Um, so there were times where I thought about it, but, you know, I think if you take the mindset of you need to, like, outplay and, like, force somebody's hand, it uh, it helps kind of mentally instead of just kind of going about everything and saying, oh, you know, I should be the next one in line or, oh, you know, I'm playing well enough to get an opportunity, you know, if someone gets hurt, it's a bad way to think, you know, I'm trying to think more along the lines of, no, I need to control what I can control and do the best I can and force their hand to bring me up. It's something that never added up for me about your story. You talk about forcing an organization's hand and look, you, you can get in an organization where there's a lot of depth at a certain position and there's just a log jam, but you bounce from a couple of different organizations and you say forcing someone's hand. I mean, you're an eighth rounder out of UCLA who hit 285 in the minors. Like, did you ever think about what it is that you needed to do to force someone's hand? Uh, like, and I've, I've encountered a lot of guys like this, but what was it for you that you ultimately decided this is what I need to do to, to force someone's hand? Um, I've had to go back and forth so many times in my mind. I can imagine. To figure out what, what it was to force their hand. and. You know, I think, I don't know. I think I'm just, I don't really, nothing about any of my game is flashy. I don't have an absolute cannon. I don't hit the ball the wrong way. Um, I don't hit the ball particularly hard. Like, no, there's nothing that, like, stands out that's like, wow, this guy is extremely physically gifted. So, um, I think you just have to play better than everybody else. Like, and I, I'm like, you know, 285 or whatever, whatever you said, like it works. Yeah, it's good. But like, there's nothing that jumps out of the page that is, you know, it's, it's not like, wow, he's 285 with a ton of power. It's like, I have to hit, mm -hmm. you know, 320 or something like that. And in order to kind of open some eyes because, you know, I'm, there's nothing about my game that's super flashy. 
what's the key to persevering in, in, when you find yourself in a situation like that? You obviously did persevere. What was key, the key, uh, I guess, mentally for you? And if there's a physical key, you can throw that in as well. But um, it's, it's a tough mental exercise to try and figure out when you're going to get your opportunity. What was that key for you? Uh, mentally, it was keep going. You know, it, it was it was keep going and not give up and just control what you can control. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time worrying about what other people were doing and how other people were playing, um, you know, playing kind of GM in my mind. And it just, it doesn't help you um, with your, it doesn't help you become the best version of yourself. And um, trying to realize that being the best person like best version of yourself as, as a player is all you can control. Um, it kind of takes the load off your shoulders and, and takes the weight off your shoulders of trying to figure out what everybody else is, is doing or how they're doing. And from a physical standpoint, I think, you know, try and stay on the field. Um, if you're healthy, you have an opportunity. If, if you're hurt, you don't have an opportunity. So uh, making sure that your body stays healthy, if anything's nagging, Figure stuff out that that you know. Figure out some soft tissue stuff that that can make it go away, and just just stay as healthy as you can on the field. So take us through your opportunity now with with San Francisco. Uh, you you signed with them as a free agent in I think it was January. Um, Posey opting out obviously really opened the door for you. What was the timeline like for you? Uh, from the time you signed with San Francisco to the time where you learned that you were going to be their opening day starter behind the plate? Yeah, so I, I you know, I had a lot of interest this year. Uh, last year was the first year that I made to big leagues, um, did well. And so there are a lot of teams. And I, I kind of, first year, I kind of had my pick of multiple teams and uh, really liked the Giants, really liked what, um, you know, what they were all about and what, what the, what they were telling me and uh, wanted an opportunity to, to learn from Posey. The guy's the best, one of the best of, of all time and certainly in the last 10 years. So I uh, wanted an opportunity to, to learn from him, pick his brain. And uh, so signed with them, got to spring training, got to learn from him. Everything happened with, with COVID and, you know, just tried to stay as ready as I could. And I didn't know how long the quarantine was going to be. It ended up being, you know, three months, um, and stay as ready as I could. We, we got back, we had this summer camp 2.0 and, um, you know, Posey opted out because, you know, he, he was adopting twin girls mm -hmm. and he, you know, he and his family thought it was the right idea and, and the right move. And everyone on our team certainly agrees with him and, you know, supports him 100%. So, you know, I think it goes back and then, you know, continue to play and, and I, you know, was, I started opening day. So, but like, I, I think the best way to, to go about it is kind of what I was talking about before was, you know, just control what I can control and like try to be the best version of myself. Uh, that's the only way to, to go about it. Um, otherwise, if you kind of future trip, it just it messes you up and it makes you it makes you nervous about stuff that you know makes you have self doubt and all that stuff and and I don't think that it's a it's a productive mindset. Would you have been the backup had he not opted out? Like, how would that have worked had had Buster not opted out? Yeah, so I mean, I was I was battling for the backup job, just like um, you know we had a couple guys, me, Brantley, uh, Trump who's on the team now. I made the mm -hmm. team. He's, uh, he made a case in, in spring training 2.0. Obviously, Joey Bart's coming in. Um, but I was battling beforehand. I was battling for the backup job. Um, and so if he would have stayed and opted in, uh, I would say, yes, there was, like, whoever won that backup job, uh, it would have been me, Brantley, someone from outside the organization, uh, Trump or, or um, Bart. We're with uh, Tyler Heineman here on the Aces Loaded podcast. I, I saw 
uh, Bart play in San Jose last year, and you could see the tools. He was injured for a time because he got hit on the wrist in actually a game against, uh, against Stockton, against us, and, and he had to miss some time. But you could definitely see the tools, especially that, that power. Um, do you feel now as, as a veteran, albeit a, a minor league veteran of many years, that you have a lot of knowledge that you can impart to Joey once he finally does make that leap? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, definitely just, just knowledge of, of playing the game. But, you know, in terms of, like, big league knowledge, no, I'll, I'll defer to, to the, the big guys, Longo, Crawford and stuff. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if, if, if he asks me any questions, I'm certainly willing to help him in any way that he can. But, um, you know, he, uh, he's a very good player, and, and sure. I think he's a special player for a long time. It's interesting, though, in terms of the perspective that you'll have versus the perspective that he'll have. I mean, he was, you know, he, he was kind of ordained right from, from the time he was drafted and fast-tracked, and you're a guy that's had to grind it away in, in the minors for as many seasons and kind of get a richer experience for how it all works. I feel like kind of that's where, where you might be able to help him, right, if, if, if it gets to that point? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. Like I definitely just in terms of like rolling with the the punches and kind of staying keeping your head down and and working like that yeah you know he hasn't really had too much um, time in the minor leagues to to fail or anything like that and not saying that he would mm-hmm. but like he just you know he this year he you know what Farhan Kapler and all that we're trying to um, say to everybody is look, he hasn't had too many at-bats above double A. He, he wants – they wanted to have a little bit more development. Uh, the best in the world, um, Trout, Posey, all these guys, they had 400, 300 career triple A at-bats, you know. So uh, they had a little bit more seasoning and, and stuff like that. And then, you know, COVID hit. So it's – people want to see Bard up here, and I understand why. And, you know, he's talented enough for sure. And, and I, I think they're just trying to – tell everyone that, you know, like it's very difficult to bring somebody up with only, you know, less than a hundred career double A at bats. So nobody really gets that. How yeah. It's, it's, hard, it's, it's a hard thing to understand, but you know, nobody is saying that he's not talented enough and he's not ready to get up here. Um, I think it's just the fact that, you know, he hasn't had that many at bats above a ball. Um, and so they, they kind of want to see how he reacts to, to certain pitching, how he reacts to catching four days in a row at, at a higher level of minor league. You know what I mean? So it's just there's development there that they wanted to see. And it's going to be really difficult to see because of all the situations here. And, you know, but they can't say enough good things about Joey. I can't say enough good things, you know, seeing him in summer camp and in, Mm -hmm. in spring training, he's, he's the real deal. And he, uh, you know, he's going to be a really good player for a long time. It's kind of a unique situation uh, this weekend. I think we're going to try and put this out on, on Friday, which would be the, uh, the, the 31st, but your brother's coming in with the Rangers. Your brother made the squad as a, as a backup outfielder. Uh, what, what's the what's the dynamic like there with with you and your brother right now, and and kind of the anticipation of being able to see him across the way on a big league diamond? I mean, we're just blessed. We're, we're so we're so fortunate to have this opportunity. First of all, so I think you know we're just excited to to play against each other. Um, but secondly, there's no there's no like competition between us. Really, we're 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 team Heineman. We're, we're so, we're so with the other play. you know, Scott got his first start yesterday. Their game was at one o'clock. I was watching the game as I was walking into the clubhouse. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, like he's watching my games, I'm watching his games where we want us, we want to do as well as we can and we want each other to do as well as, as they can. So it's going to be a little difficult for me to, you know, if I'm catching and he's, and he's hitting to like, try and get him out and be happy with getting him out. You know, it's going to be difficult in my mind. Um, yeah. But, you know, so it, <laughs> that's going to be, that's going to be something weird. Um, but I think, I think, I mean, I, I'll, once we're in the flow of the game and, and all that, it's, it's not going to matter to me. And 
you know, well, he can do super well against every other team. It's just when I'm catching, when we're, when we're at the, uh, we're playing the, the Rangers, I don't want him to do well. I, I feel you. It's going to be such a cool thing. Uh, is he as gifted with the card tricks as you are, by the way? I've, I've, seen, I've seen and I've heard uh, some stories with you and, and the card tricks. Does, he have, does Scott have that ability? No, he, uh, I'm the only one in the family that really <laughs> dabbles in that kind of stuff. He's uh, way more physically gifted. I have a little bit more, um, I have a little bit more of the uh, accessory knowledge and, uh, and some of the uh, hobby, hobby kind of traits. When, when did that kind of become a thing for you when you started? And I have, I have a, a good buddy of mine does card tricks just like you, and it, it kind of blows me away every time. I don't think I'd have the ability to do that, but when did you realize it was something you enjoyed and, and could actually do? Uh, that was in 2015. I played in the Dominican Republic, and we had a rain delay. I knew some really simple tricks and loved the reaction I got. So I went straight to the hotel room. <laughs> that night and just looked up beginner card magic and kind of messed around with stuff. It was difficult. And then, you know, showed them, loved the reaction I got and it kind of just blossomed from there. You know, I, I enjoyed being able to do something right in front of somebody's eyes that they have no idea how it happens. And it looks like magic, even though to me, you know, I know obviously all the moves that are happening. Mm -hmm. The sleight of hand. It's just, it's, yeah, it's, it's really cool just to bring joy, but also like some sort of fear and like craziness to the, to somebody, you know, I, I, I get it. Yeah. It's a tough, it's a tough uh, thing to kind of grasp, but like just the reaction that, that people have, it's everyone's reaction is, is different and unique and, but it's always it's always cool. It's always it's 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 always awesome. So it kind of makes me continue to want to do more. It's amazing what can happen in a, in a rain delay and what what uh, what can start when you're just kind of sitting there with with nothing to do. Especially in Dominican, I can only imagine. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I want I want to take you back to UCLA for a minute. You played for John Savage, who was a Reno guy. Um, what was it like to play for John at at UCLA and and to have that experience? I mean, Coach Savage is probably one of the best baseball guys that I know and you know just being able to play for him especially being a pitching guy like and me being a catcher you just learn so much um how to call a game uh how to manage a staff um how to separate your offense from your defense and and all that you know he's just I'm still in close contact with him you know on a weekly basis and he's like I consider him like a super big mentor to me. So I, I'm, you know, I was so lucky that I was, that I chose UCLA and you know, that I got an opportunity to play for him. I was, I was uh, talking to my buddy, Jason Schwartz last night, who's the, the broadcaster for the Jetthawks said yeah. you're one of his favorites, by the way, to come through uh, in his time. Um, but he was saying that when there was a game you were playing in Lancaster and coach Savage actually was up with him in the booth, uh, just watching. And, and when you say that there's that closeness, in, in Jason's story that he told me, I can kind of see that where he comes to to Lancaster to watch you play and sits in the broadcast booth just to to kind of see what you've been up to and, and how you're doing and the mechanics of it all. Uh, it seems like a, a pretty special relationship, like you were saying. Yeah, you know, I'd like to say that it, it's very personal like that, and it is, but it's he has that relationship with all of the former players that he has that plays in the big leagues that are still in the minor leagues. Like, you know, he just really cares about the development of you as a person and as a player. Um, and he's not afraid to tell you, you know, what he thinks of how you're doing, how, how you're going about your stuff, business. But like, you know, he's even if, so he's not able to come to any of the games here, obviously because of, because of everything that's going on, but like he's watching all the games, he's watching Bauer pitch, he's watching Cole pitch, he's watching me catch. You know, Valleca play like Kramer or mm -hmm. Kramer is injured right now, but like he just he 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 watches a Plutko, he watches everybody, and you know he just checks in from time to time, and and he knows how you're doing, but he wants to hear from you and how you feel you're doing, and and you know 
it keeps a, a relationship and a bond like that. That's awesome, man. Uh, a couple quick ones to close it out, and and I know we got to let you go, but uh, you're you talk about catching Bauer at UCLA and then those guys, and you're an active guy on social media. If you wanna if you wanna follow Tyler, it's uh, at T Heineman thirteen. Um, but obviously Trevor's very active on social media. Uh, when, when everything was going on with negotiations, he was very vocal. Um, can you touch a little bit on how, how players can, can make an impact through social media and, and kind of the new age of power to the players, if you will, where you guys can take to, to your Twitter accounts and, and voice yourselves and, and make an impact uh, and, and kind of be present in, uh, in all that's going on in baseball? Yeah, so, you know, from from that standpoint, I think it's extremely important just because, you know, it allows the world, it allows other people just to know what you're thinking and, and you know, know kind of where you stand on things. Uh, but, you know, I, I enjoy Twitter, Instagram and stuff just to interact with fans and, and interact with people uh, just to kind of just break down that barrier of the fan and, and the player um, just so you can have interaction, two-way interaction and that they can realize and start to think that, you know, the only thing that separates me from a 12 year old kid that interacts with me on Twitter is the fact that I'm a little bit older and I chose baseball as my profession. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I'm, there's nothing about me that's special like this 12 year old kid, if, if this is his dream and his passion, like he could be exactly where I am. I'm 29. I don't, like, don't do the math. 17 years from, from, from where he is right now, you know, there's no, yep. there's no difference uh, whatsoever. So just kind of breaking down that barrier and, and telling and showing people that like, it's, you know, we're not like these people on a pedestal and, and even so I'm, I'm not at that that level of you know stardom even the guys that are stars like you know they get they're just they're they're just normal people that chose baseball as their profession and their career and they happen to be good at it and work at it um but they're the exact same and you know that, that that's a that's something that people can pursue and you know you can make your dreams reality if, if that's if, if you want to pursue baseball. Such a good perspective. Such a good perspective. Uh, last but not least, I want to ask if you've felt safe through this, this whole getting back to baseball process. You probably have kind of a unique perspective on, on what the Marlins are going through right now because you were just there last year. Um, but have you felt safe? Have the protocols been followed in your mind? And then can you give us that perspective on what's happened in, in Miami in the last week? Yeah, so um, I felt extremely safe. I think the Giants are doing an incredible job. Uh, LJ Pe uh, Petra Petra uh, is, is the guy who's designated. He's the assistant um, assistant uh, trainer, but he's designated as like the, I don't even know what the word is, but he's basically the guy in charge of making sure all the protocols are in place. Uh, everyone's doing their spit tests and, and all that stuff. And just, I mean, and making sure everyone's mask is on. He's like, he's on top of everything and he's done an incredible job. So I feel very safe. Um, MLB, I think has done an incredible job of trying to manage so many people and, you know, the positivity rate in MLB is still way below the, uh, it might be a little higher with, with Miami, but it's still way below the national average. And, uh, you know, we're in close contact with each other every single day. So, I think that's a testament to the players and also to MLB and with the protocols in place. Um, as far as Miami, I, I don't really know what happened. Um, you know, if somebody went out, you know, went out and went to dinner, went, you know, there's so many things that could happen. Someone could have sure. taken an Uber, they could have gone to a club. Um, they could have flown their wife in, you know what I mean? Like so many things could have happened. It just, I think, I think one, it, it should scare everybody else. And, and it's, you know, puts a little fear in, in me just to make sure that we're ultra careful in everything that we're doing. And two, you know, showing how fast it can spread um, just from 
one person's mistake and it couldn't it might not have been a mistake you know it could have been like like i said it could have been someone's wife flew in on a plane and contracted like there's so many different things yep. but if it was a mistake you know knowing and being able to see that one person's mistake can affect the entire team you know and uh and then in turn affect all of baseball and maybe you know stop it for all of baseball so uh just kind of seeing something like that just make it just makes you ultra aware and ultra cautious to trying to make sure that you're doing the exact the right thing you know not taking any public transportation um you know making sure anybody that you see is tested and then quarantined before you see them uh, making sure that you're maintaining social distance while you're in the clubhouse and all that stuff you know it, it's a it's a weird time for sure it's it's a weird time but i'm so okay with with doing all of these protocols mm -hmm. um if it means playing baseball during during this time amen uh hey man thank you so much for the, for the time uh we know you're busy these days uh and deservedly so uh, so happy you're getting the opportunity i feel like it's long overdue and uh go get them and uh, we'll, we'll catch you again down the road all right yeah i appreciate it thank you thanks for having me on you got it man tyler heineman san francisco giants catcher we'll be back to wrap up the aces loaded podcast after this Hi, I'm Stack Bay Rudy. Welcome to This Week in Aces History, powered by Ide Bailey. Each week, we will highlight significant moments from the club's past. On August 2nd, 2009, the Aces staged a memorable comeback at Greater Nevada Field against Colorado Springs. Trailing 9-3 in the seventh inning, Reno scored seven runs to come out with a 10-9 win. Trent Oltgen and Brandon Allen each had home runs for the Aces. On August 5th, 2011, the Aces also came from behind against Memphis at Greater Nevada Field, winning that contest 6-4. Thanks for listening to the Aces Loaded podcast. That was This Week in Aces History, powered by Ide Bailey. We'll be right back. Back to wrap up the Aces Loaded podcast, Zach Bay Rudy, along with Vince Rafino. Thanks to Tyler Heineman. Uh, what what a what a guy! What a journey! And talk about perseverance, Vince. Like he's for a guy that has hit as well as he has, and I, I reiterated this to him. For a guy that's hit as well as he has, he was not a twenty-something round selection. He's an eighth rounder out of a program like UCLA. For him to have to wait that long to get the opportunity that he did, eight years uh, to finally get called up. It uh, takes a lot of, of uh, mental stamina to hang if you're a baseball player. And if you played baseball or been around the game, you know exactly what I'm talking about as far as not letting it get to you mentally. But he did a great job of, of kind of staying the course and finally getting paid off with an opportunity. Yeah, he's a great story. Someone definitely that uh, I think a lot of players or MLB should really amplify. I mean, because those are the stories that show the perseverance, the passion, the the love for the sport that um, that he brings, and then he tries to bring that to to kids, like he talks about, and, and to fans, and to break down that third or fourth wall that seems to be between athletes at times and and regular people um, to understand that they're they're regular people too. And he really brings a sense of normalcy mm -hmm. to being an athlete, and and I mean that in a, in such a great way. Um, you know, just referencing having worked with him uh, on the field and, and having done some things. Um, you don't get that all the time. And, and so when you do come across that, um, it's appreciative and then also celebrate that and um, try to amplify that as much as, as, as we can. Uh, I think that baseball needs more players like Tyler that um, will, will put themselves out there and, and try to interact with fans and, and promote themselves in a way that promotes baseball overall and, and the passion that a lot of people have for the sport. Yeah, and we, we really appreciate him taking the time. He's a busy dude and uh, could not have been nicer. Uh, before we leave, give us a quick update on the content at uh, renoaces.com. I know you've been working on a, on a couple of pieces there. Yeah, we have all kinds of great stuff. Uh, if you uh, check it out right now, we're going to have a piece on Tyler Heineman up um, so you can kind of catch up with his story, um, get some of the background 
um, on his seasons and the trades that, and kind of his player movement. Um, we have an aces in the bigs update as well. So some former players that aren't on the D-backs, but are former aces that are performing with some other clubs. Um, you can read up on them. You can catch up on our podcast here. Um, subscribe to our newsletter to be get all of the latest up-to-date um, information. Um, so that's kind of your hub. Go to renoaces.com. We have everything kind of laid out for you um, and all kinds of stuff to fuel your baseball interest here, even though the aces aren't playing. There's a lot of baseball stuff going on and a lot of our former uh, players making big impacts in this season. Sure. Also, Reno1868FC.com to get the soccer schedule. And again, follow along the broadcast. I'll be on the radio, 94.5 FM, and then Nevada Sportsnet on the television side. Thanks to Tyler Heineman. Vince, thank you. And for everybody uh, for the Reno Aces, Zach Bayrudi saying so long. We'll see you next time on the Aces Loaded Podcast. Thanks for having me, Zach. Everyone. Anytime.